Mark Diaz is a 28-year-old self-employed barber based in Daly City, California. He sees about 50 clients per week and his business makes over $10,000 per month. In this video, he'll show us his work setup, share his journey, and give advice on how you can also start your own barber or beauty business. I don't know if you can get that, but I got the, the scents. The first impression is when they come in and they smell something that yeah. smells good. Mm -hmm. Happy Cuts is what I started at, so I always have to pay homage to Happy Cuts. These are very special to me. I first started doing barber battles in uh, 2014. One was my first one. Um, it was for the Bay Area Barber Battle for the Fast Fade. I got first place. The following year, I ran it back, so I got, that was two times. That third year, I got second place at that same one for the old school, I did Pompadour. So in 2016, I got the best razor fade. 2016 was a big year for me. Got another fast fade. It's my regular SMA setup. In here, it's all messy, but this is all my equipment and everything. So happy cuts right here, right? This was actually my very first sign that went with me. This was from the garage. Uh, that green that was always just inspiring to me. So that green, the chair became green to pay homage again to Happy Cuts. So there's those little details and that's what the theme in this whole and curated ended up being, it, that money green, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Back when I was 12 years old, I tired of paying money at the barber shop, so I took the money and I kept it. And I just decided to shave my own head. And from there, um, I actually did a trick where it was only like a two on top with the with the sideburns, the ice picks. And uh, I would shave my head, go to the barber shop and get lined up and then just follow that lineup. And then uh, from there, my buddies in seventh grade, they were like, oh, cut my hair, cut my hair. Yeah. Then their cousin um, started paying me. I was like, oh no, like, I, I can't take this. I just love cutting hair. And they were like, no, this is how you make money. This is how you start a business. And ever since then, eventually after middle school, I went to Archbishop Reardon, which is an all boys school. And obviously that helped my business. And I really feel like God put me on that path. Uh, without me knowing and basically I ended up Turning all of those guys that I went to school with into all clientele and from there it took off So I started at Fresh Cuts Barbershop and then I went to Cut the Contrast which was on Ocean Avenue in San Francisco From there I went back to Fresh Cuts and now here I am at my own studio To my knowledge, um, I believe that you have to be like 15 years old. I don't even think you need to graduate from high school, which is crazy. For me, personally, I went to Baby Barber College, which was on 3rd Street. And it's actually, unfortunately, it's shut down now, but we just had to complete 1,500 hours. A lot a lot of things have changed. Like, yeah. it used to cost like $6,000 back okay. then uh, for a full tuition. Whereas now, I believe it's about 14000 It kind of doubled, but you can get financial aid now. Sure. And back uh, then you couldn't? No, back then you couldn't. So you just, just had to pay pocket. straight. Yeah, okay. exactly. But being in barber college, you don't really learn like how to cut hair. And I apologize. I don't want to like, <laughs> like bash any instructors, but you, you learn from your peers, you know? Yeah. What they want to do is just teach you how to pass their state exam. Yeah. And you complete the whole 1500 hours just that way. And from there, yeah, you go to the state board of barbering and you complete the test. I actually failed my first time doing it. School was Tuesday to Saturday, and from Tuesday to Friday, you're operating like an, you go to class in the morning for like two hours, yeah. you operate like a regular barber shop, yeah. and uh, on Fridays, you do a practical, which is a practice for the exam, yeah. and then Saturday, it's just all like regular barber shop things. So you're getting the experience on like how an actual barber shop operates and does all of that. Yeah. So yeah. I personally think that YouTube is the way to do it. Cause so YouTube, YouTube, yeah. YouTube can teach you everything. And back then, when I started, we didn't have that outlet, right? Like I learned how to cut hair first, and then figured out that there was YouTube, and there was like Cake and His Randy, people like that. I'm not sure if you're familiar with no. them. Yeah. So now I would say start on YouTube, get the essential clippers and all of that. Just get to cutting. Honestly, start on your start on yourself. Yeah. Like just like I did, and then mess some people up. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it's gonna happen. Yeah. Um, and from there, you know, you just network with people. For me, I was scared. I didn't get cut out of barbershop, so I didn't have the network that I do now. So now there's Instagram. And it wasn't if it wasn't for Instagram, um, I wouldn't have been in the position that I ended up being in. Right. Because I didn't know any barbers. I didn't know how to get a job. I, I was just cutting hair in the garage. Like, right. what am I gonna do That's after I graduate? That's yeah. 
have some money ready in like the 10,000 range. Okay. Um, Why is that? Why so specific? Because if I could be honest, I have a 100 square foot room and I probably spent about 10,000 just starting all of this and it may not look like it, but I can't even believe how people have a thousand square foot barbershop or just businesses in general have that because it was so expensive to start up this little space already. Right. Make sure you have the connections for supplies, have like wholesale representatives ready by your side. Make sure that you ask questions, your previous shop owner, ask them, where did you get your chairs? How did you get your mirrors? Um, what, what things go into creating the business? Because when I started here, I didn't know that you needed an establishment license and a business license. I just moved in and I was like, cool, business is ready just like a garage, uh -huh. you know? And how'd you find out? Um, everybody here. So at Solo Salons, we have 32 other studios, all different businesses in hair, uh, beauty, you know, things of that nature. And they went up to me and they're like, Mark, did you happen to get your business license and establishment license? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> I had no idea. And that was just on me. I never, I didn't ask questions and I should have known. Sure. And yeah, that's, that's definitely one piece of advice that I would give somebody. For me, I've always been an independent contractor. Right. And I thought, oh, I am my own boss. And just opening a business is the same thing. It's just, it's right. under my name now. Right. I had no idea that there were other things that go into that, you know? Licenses. It's like exactly, that. tax write-offs are different as well. So uh -huh. there's things like that. It was coming off of the pandemic. We, I definitely knew that I had a lot of customers and clients that weren't too comfortable being next to another barber. Um, at the previous shop that I was at, we had partitions separating us. And yeah, that kind of made people feel a lot more comfortable. However, I felt that even though it was a transparent barrier, it was still a barrier nonetheless. And it took away from the barbershop vibe. And I kind of felt as if I'm gonna work alone and I'm gonna feel like I work alone. I'd rather do it and have a private room to myself. Yeah. Just get to know your clients. What kind of people do you bring in for me? We don't talk about sports and talk crap to each other, stuff like that. We talk about deep stuff. So it's not the typical stuff you see on like a, a know, movie. Yeah. No, no, no. Ice Cube, no, none of that. <laughs> For other barbers, it may be like that. Mental health checks, to sure. be honest with you. How's your family? You know, how's your relationships? All of that. People people find comfort in talking to, to you as a barber. So being in, in this room alone, it just gave them the opportunity to be themselves and actually tell me and express what they need to express when they can't have, they don't have anybody else to talk to. And what type of feedback do you get from people? So I started, <laughs> like every other barber, text me, we'll put it in the books, yeah. whatever. I always did it one week in advance, just because I'm the type of person, I love spontaneity. I wanna be able to, if one week in advance, I wanna be able to go to LA or something for the week. I know that I have the freedom to do that, mm -hmm. which is, a great reason why you should be your own boss. Yeah. So why would I enslave myself to a schedule that's two weeks in advance, three weeks in advance, four weeks in advance? That just allows more space for you to potentially cancel on your clients last minute and create more of a more of an issue with them. There would be people like, oh, what are you doing next month? I need I need a cut for, you know, I'm going back to school or something. I'm oh, I got you, I got you. Next thing you know, they show up, but I had somebody in the chair because like I released my actual schedule that week, yeah. but I had promised somebody four weeks ago right. Yeah, come in at this day, and that just left room for everybody forgetting. Right, right. Um, it's more of a me issue. So a lot of accidental bookings or double bookings, bookings yeah, double you know. Bookings, right. So it was, it was, it's really to avoid double bookings. Yeah. I release my schedule every Sunday at one o'clock. Okay. Um, I figured for people that go to church, it was a time that church is probably over, <laughs> and the people that don't, that party Saturday night. Yeah. You're just waking up. So. That's really good. I definitely kept all of that in my mind. Sunday at one o'clock, my schedule releases. It's like a shoe release yeah. every week. And I say that as humble as I can. And for the people that don't know what psychographics is, it's pretty much like creating a demand, or at least in my instance, it was creating a demand for myself. And I remember having a conversation with my cousin. And I was like, how do I become the Louis Vuitton of haircuts? How do I become the Supreme of haircuts? How do I do all of that? And we talked about limited availability. And this is what I always wanted to teach people. You know, when people ask me to go teach at, you know, barber college, right. they always ask me to, teach how to cut hair, but I want to teach people the business aspect. Limit your availability. Mm -hmm. You create that demand. So ever since I started doing that, I would only release, what, 50, 60 spots a week. Mm -hmm. But I had like 200 clients. So that every week. week that week? Uh, 200 clients oh, in, in as general. a whole. Okay. Yeah, 200, 250. It's only about a fourth can, can really book. You have to fight for your slot. 
that created a demand. Everybody knew it. Then word got around. Oh, it, it's so hard to book. It's so hard to book. Well, this guy must be he yeah. must be good, right? Yeah. I don't even think I'm the best barber. I like to think that I know how to handle my business with my clientele. Yeah, obviously what works for you may be different for a lot of other people. Absolutely, right? if you don't have a clientele to do that, I wouldn't necessarily push that right Did away. Did you start that way, right off the bat? And no, how I would do it was text me. Te text me the Sunday and uh, yeah, and we'll figure it out. But what happens when you have 10 guys asking for Thursday at five o'clock? Right, right, <laughs> and, yeah. And that's why I switched over to online booking. Were people, um, how did people react when you first told them like, hey, instead of texting me, book on this platform or whatever? Was there any pushback on that? Uh, yeah, for the people, the 10 people that would ask you for Thursday at five, yeah, they're like, dude, you don't even have this, this spot available for me. And I would explain to them, well, imagine how I felt having to deal with all of your availabilities and you guys are thinking, I'm picking and choosing. You think that I'm just playing favorites. Well, this was a way for me to allow people to understand, I'm not playing favorites. This is, I'll open my schedule. What you get is what you get. And you know, again, I, I love my clients and I say this the most humble way, but it just took so much stress off of me and I'm so thankful for online booking. Yeah. Half a year. Okay. Yeah, half a year. I think I just got over that curve because I've been here about a year now. Uh -huh. um, obviously, what you put in in this industry is what you get out. So you can make that happen faster. You can make it happen slower. Mm -hmm. But for me, being in this space wasn't necessarily a uh, an, an upgrade in my income. It was just more for my, my happiness and yeah. my client's happiness. The things as well is being here there's no walk-ins, right? Like this is a pretty exclusive private space that being at a barbershop, I would have to turn down clients and they're like, well, why do you, why can't I get a haircut? Your client's not even here yet. And dealing with those kind of like reactions uh, made it so difficult because barbering is a community job and you want to service the community. But when you're booked, it's so hard to say no to somebody, you know? Everybody knows coming through those first front doors, it's going to be an exclusive, like everybody here probably goes by appointments, you know? So. It made it so much easier for me. And is that why you went this route versus just like opening up like a... Yeah, I mean, I, I had the clientele for it. I was blessed enough to have the clientele for this. Yeah. And you know, there, there have been other businesses in here that ended up leaving early because they thought being at the mall was going to bring them clients. But it's private in here, like I said. Yeah, so people don't really walk through this. Especially this side, yeah, yeah. at all. So a Word of mouth for sure when I first started and Instagram. Instagram was the biggest tool. That's why I think people when starting out, go ahead and do Instagram. When I was starting out, I didn't know any barbers, no barbers that worked in the shop at least. If it wasn't for Instagram, um, my friend, Junior Junior Argente, he actually found me on Instagram. We, we didn't know each other. Uh, he saw me walk into the barber shop one day, but he, I guess, saw my Instagram and he was like, look at this 18 year old kid. Uh -huh. I'm about, I'm about to leave my barber shop. I think I want to give him my chair. And he reached out to me on Instagram, never met him in my life. Uh -huh. And he he took a chance on me. And he are. actually works here now too. Oh, uh, does he? Yeah. Okay. He's taken me to every barber shop I've ever worked at. Uh -huh. And he's just been that big brother role that I've ever needed. So Instagram has been a place where you're able to just really connect with someone more on a personal level, right? Yeah. Right, just kind of through seeing each other's profiles and, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah you, you act like you know them if yeah. you've seen them for the first time ever, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's been but, amazing. But in reality, you've been like DMing each other for the last couple yeah, of years. Yeah, that's, that's all it is. So my, uh, my first name is actually Mark Randall, super Filipino. Okay. You know, to have two names as your first name. Yeah, one of my best friends um, back in middle school, she actually gave me the name. Uh, she was just like, oh, I don't like Randall. Let's go with Ranjo. Why? I have no idea. It doesn't get too much deeper than that. But after I went by Ranjo, that was my MySpace name. Yeah. That was my AIM name. Yeah. That was that was all my usernames. Okay. And then uh, it was cool to have three A's back then in 2009, right? Yeah. So I ended up doing Ranjo with three A's, yeah. even though I, I could have gotten R-A-N-J-O on Instagram. Yeah. That. It's just bad marketing. <laughs> Pass your card out. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Where? To everybody. My friend Easy the Barber, he started getting his name out by literally handing out business cards and he was taping them to parking meters outside of the barber college. 
and his business card was everywhere. He's made such an impact in like, like two, three years that he's been cutting hair. Uh -huh. And it's just amazing. Like I've never seen anyone do actual footwork like that in years. I have two services and it's haircut and haircut with facial hair. Haircut is 60, haircut with facial hair is 70. So okay. just an additional 10. Anywhere from 40 to 50 now. Back then, um, I was seeing at least 60. Work smarter, not harder, right? So. <laughs> Did you have to dial that down a bit? Uh, yeah, I used to do some 30 minute haircut, like, like buzz cuts, okay. 30 minute haircuts, and, and then, yeah, and then styled haircuts for 45. Now everything's just the same. Okay. I started at the barbershop at $20 a haircut. Okay. I was actually completely content with that. I thought haircuts were always gonna be $20 yeah. and if I wanted to make more money you just hustle a little bit harder right. the way that the market for haircuts just kept raising and raising and raising it was amazing I still don't know what kind of validates a $50 haircut $60 haircut $100 haircut personally for me I was charging $45 back at the shop that I was just previously at 45 for a buzz cut and 55 for a style cut okay. moving here I decided to go 60 I thought that a $15 markup for buzz cuts was kind of a lot already, yeah. even though the people that had style cuts were only paying an additional $5. And the reason why I decided to do one price for all haircuts was just because I had to think about my value. What was, why did people come get cut by me? And I think one of my fortes is definitely my blend. What haircuts have my blend? Every single one. And so you're you're not necessarily coming here for how much work I'm putting in, but it's, it's the product, it's the actual yeah. product. Yeah. 1500 a month. A lot. <laughs> I have no idea what the actual number is, but everything I purchase has my business in mind. And I thought about this was to charge more off the bat. Why is that? When I was getting my buzz on social media and everything, I try to be the humble guy of not, <laughs> not using my my buzz and just staying content with how much i was making when really i should have raised the bar because going back at it now my clients didn't even care like right, right. they would have paid whatever it was at the time right. and although i love myself for trying not to be greedy that's where you have to separate business and and you know personal know your worth yeah so the state board of barbering they definitely come in and check they got to make sure Everything is clean, right? Especially now. And so, like I said, you need a business license, an establishment license, your barber's license. All three of those uh, things come into play. Mm -hmm. So, if you're just starting out, um, absolutely get a spot that has a lot of foot traffic, or the barbershop itself, or the wherever you're working at, has the reputation. Because for me, starting out at Fresh Cuts, uh, they had a great reputation. Yeah. Like, it was, on Vice with Eddie Vong. Okay. Um, my friend Jules, Julius Caesar, he's now in LA, yeah. but he helped brand it so much. They, there were rappers coming. Pilo shot a music video there back in the day. So moving in into a location that either A, has a lot of foot traffic, or B, has a high reputation is 100% nece uh, necessary. Okay. Uh, so looking back on my Booksy account, altogether, I've, that people that have booked with me it's been like 500 different people. My recurring clients for the last three months, or every month for the last three months, have been about 150. And although that seems so like far out, um, a big chunk of that were out of towners, or people that made me like their, their backup barber, or if we're being honest, it was just too difficult to book with me and it turned them off. So this is the uh, wall magic clips. Okay. Um, I got my arm kind of, but you know, the wall magic clips yeah, with the fade blade. So and what does that do? So uh, this is my blending clipper. Okay. Um, it's modified. I did put a new blade on it, and okay. this is an Andis uh, blade by Filthy Blends with the wall clipper. So I got the Andis Slimline Pros right here. Okay, that's what you use to line people up. To line people up. This has a modified um, Kenny Duncan sharpened blade, and you can see it's like, yeah, I don't know, it's super sharp. Okay. This is for the edge ups. This is for balding right here. Uh -huh. um, it's the Andis Pro Foil Shaver. 
I, I'm hoping to see it twice in five years. I hope to have at least two barbershops in five years. Um, I feel like that's a big reach, but my vision for curated in the next five years, at least for the first barbershop, would be to have all new barbers that have no clientele and to teach them how to cut the way that I can cut. I don't say this to say that I think I have the best style, I think I'm the best barber. I say this because I have a product that, and I have too many clients that want this product. And I want to be able to give all of my clients this product and put money in other barbers pockets. And each one teach one, right? I want to be able to teach all these newcomers how to retain clients, how to cut hair well, and how to give great customer service. And you can teach anybody to cut hair, really? but you can't teach personality, right? You can't teach common sense and things things of that nature. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you're looking to work for Curated. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a good personality. Yeah, there's this plug. Yep. Hey, thanks, man, I appreciate it. Of course. Yeah.